All right, time to go teach. Welcome to this next episode where we are going to be looking at the properties of water. Last time where we left off was with a bunch of different properties of water. So this time we're going to cover those properties of water. Specifically, we only have one target of the day. That's it. Compare the key properties of water and their causes. So let's begin. First, these are the properties of water that were on our last slide. And so now we are just going to be looking at each and every single one of them, one at a time, starting off with high heat of vaporization. What does that mean? Well, here it is. It's a liquid. It's not a gas. So when we're looking around at this wonderful world that we have, you know that a lot of it is covered in water. Now, what's really neat about that is that for its mass, water shouldn't be a liquid. Remember last time we talked about how it's so light. Well, again, a lot of the gases around us have more mass than water. The less massive that a molecule is, the more likely it would be that it would be at a gas at lower temperatures. But it's not. And again, that's due to that hydrogen bonding. Because those water molecules are attracted toward each other, they don't spread out like a gas, but they condense toward each other, forming a liquid even at very high temperatures. And that even goes for clouds, just so you're aware. Clouds are not water vapor. Clouds are not gas. Clouds are droplets of water that you're looking at, and they can be extremely massive, by the way. Clouds aren't light, and they aren't a gas. They are water droplets that happen to be up suspended in the air because of air currents, okay? So the key is, though, that many molecules that are gases happen to be much heavier even than water. And it's all due to that polarity that pulls those molecules together. That means it takes a lot of heat for it to vaporize or to become a gas. Specifically, most of you are aware, it takes 100 degrees Celsius to turn water from its phase of liquid to the phase of gas. That's extremely hot for a molecule of its mass. Every other molecule that is water's mass would be a gas at much, much lower temperatures. So water stays a liquid at higher temperatures, which is great for living conditions because we need liquid water. It takes a lot of heat to turn that water into a gas. Next, surface tension. This is just something that's really cool and something that you have probably experienced at least sometime in your life. It's dealing with the fact that the water molecules are cohering with each other. So because those water molecules are holding on to each other very tightly, they make this mesh of interactions that makes it so that it requires a certain amount of force to break through that surface of water. If you've ever done a belly flop, you've experienced surface tension. It's because of surface tension that you have the slap of the water across your body. That's because those hydrogen bonds between the water molecules, again, are holding that and forming that network, and you have to break through those hydrogen bonds. Because you have to break those hydrogen bonds, the attractive force between different water molecules, you have to put in a certain amount of force to break through. And that's why it ends up hurting if you land it right. Some insects are actually able to just rest upon water. Because of the cohesion between the water molecules, the insect doesn't just break through. Now, if this insect was pushed through, it would sink. Because it's not that the insect is less dense. It's not that it would float on water. It just isn't massive enough to break the surface tension. If the surface tension was broken or disturbed, then it would just sink and fall right through and it would drown. Water also has something called high specific heat. First off, we have to recognize heat. Heat is just the measurement of the movement of molecules, how fast they are moving around. That's pretty much what heat is determined by. And the specific heat is a property of matter. Specific heat 
literally means that you are going to take one gram of that substance and heat it one degree Celsius. And then how much heat energy is required. And what does that actually result in is some really cool stuff. It helps us stabilize systems. That's not just talking about a system as in an ecosystem. It's also talking about a system as in you and me or a single cell. All of those things are stabilized by this property of water. Aquatic ecosystems, well, they stay relatively the same temperature, day, night, even if you have some very large fluctuations in temperature of the air, the water temperature stays relatively stable. More humidity also stabilizes an ecosystem. In deserts where there is no humidity, you can have massive temperature fluctuations because there's no water vapor to hold the heat in. Once the sun goes down, the heat radiates off of the earth and nothing holds it in. It just goes into the air and is gone. So that's why the temperature swing in a desert is extremely large. Whereas if you go to more humid areas, your temperature swings are much, much, much smaller. And it also helps us, specifically homeotherms, warm-blooded animals, where we then are able to maintain our body temp. It helps us maintain our body temperature because water has a high specific heat, because it takes so much energy to warm it up. And that means to cool it down, it would have to lose a lot of energy as well, just so we're aware. So it's a very, very strong stabilizing force. Next, it's more dense as a liquid than a solid. And this is crazy because what you might be aware of is that as you go from gas to liquid to solid, things condense. They get closer and closer and closer together. So as atoms get closer and closer and closer together, you end up getting more and more and more and more and more solid, except for water. Water, the water molecules are actually going to spread out as they go from liquid to solid, which is pretty much different from every other molecule that we know of. Water will spread out as it becomes a solid because it forms something called a crystalline solid. And we'll look at what a crystalline solid is in just a second, but I want you guys to sort of understand what I think of this is or how I think about it. If you've ever walked through a hallway that is densely packed, you know that people are all crowded together and you're like brushing shoulders and you know, you probably have people invading your personal space and you know, that's just not something that you enjoy. But then if we were to have every single person just stop, they probably wouldn't be all comfortable being all close together still. They probably would feel a little bit, a little too tightly packed in. And so you'd sort of have people start to maybe spread out a little bit, be like, hey, get out of my personal space. And, and the whole grouping of people would probably spread a little bit out and sort of give everyone a little bit of space. Well, water does something sort of like this. It spreads out as it becomes a solid because when it's moving, well, yes, a slightly positive hydrogen and a slightly positive hydrogen are going to repel. But if one slightly positive hydrogen is moving by another slightly positive hydrogen, it might get a little closer, it might get pushed a little closer than it would normally say, want to get. It got a little closer than what would be ideal. And also, slightly negative oxygens and slightly negative oxygens, they could also end up getting pushed a little bit closer together than, all, than again, what would be ideal. But when you get to be a solid, and now there's no longer that motion going by, well, they're not going to get closer than what would be ideal. They're going to get into a fixed framework that is ideal. So if we look at water, if we look at the water molecules, so they're all around, and every once in a while you'll see like hydrogen's a little too close to hydrogen. And you could end up with an oxygen, maybe a little too close to an oxygen, just because of how it's moving and how they end up orienting themselves. And, and remember, this is always in motion. And these molecules are always moving around. And so on occasion, they might just get a little too close. But when the water molecules start to slow down, in other words, as we remove heat energy, 
and they start to slow down to the point where they are going to stop moving, which is basically from four degrees Celsius down to zero degrees Celsius, the water molecules start to orient themselves in a very specific pattern. And that pattern is going to look something like this. Okay, so this is the pattern that will occur in ice, where you now see it's always hydrogen and oxygen facing each other. And yes, I had to do this in three dimensions because this water molecule had to rotate. So that hydrogen is actually facing into the screen. This one is facing into the screen. So we have to remember that these molecules are in three dimensions. And so that also means that this is, would be, we'd have other water molecules out here forming very similar structures. And this is why we call it crystalline lattice because crystalline structures mean it has a repeating pattern. And you can see that their pattern repeats and repeats and repeats and repeats as we go across. So this is what happens with ice. And we see that we have all of this empty space it's not due to like gas being trapped in ice. It's not due to little air bubbles or anything like that. No, it's not about that. It's actually about emptiness. There is nothing in this central area. It is empty space, nothing there. And that means that this ice will be less dense than its liquid equivalent. It also means that ice forms at the top of a lake or a stream or whatever your aquatic ecosystem happens to be. So when we get into the winter months, the ice is going to form at the top. And that's crucial for the survival of that ecosystem because one of the things it also does is it provides an insulating force from the wind that comes across and it makes it so that we don't end up freezing necessarily the whole way down. Because if the whole thing froze solid, well, that is going to kill some of our organisms. Ice, it actually helps insulate the rest of our aquatic ecosystem. Next is its ability to dissolve polar substances. And I put my, my coffee mug up there. This is what I bring to work every single day. And uh, there's my thermos. So here's how it works out. I put that there because I use this property every single day when I take and put a little bit of sugar in my coffee because the partially positive hydrogen atoms, well, they're gonna interact with partially negatives of the other molecule. And the partially negative oxygens are going to interact with the partial positives of the molecule. And that means water will be a solvent. A solvent dissolves things. It breaks them apart. I want to be clear on this. It doesn't break the sugar molecule apart. It breaks apart the solid that is really a bunch of those molecules compressed together and they get pulled apart, each one individually. So water pulls molecules apart from each other. It doesn't break apart the molecule. So that's what we are talking about when we talk about water being a solvent. A solvent is the thing that dissolves or breaks down another substance. The dissolved material, that's a solute. So in my coffee, sugar is my solute. Water is a solvent, sugar is the solute, and together they form a solution. That is something that water is really good at. Now, water can't dissolve everything. Water can only dissolve polar substances because if it's nonpolar, well, water doesn't interact with it, and that means it can't break it apart. Capillary action. It's the ability, as it says over there, of a liquid to flow or move through spaces without any assistance. Trees use capillary action every single day. It's through capillary action that water is able to move from the roots all the way up to their leaves. The water is cohering to itself and adhering to the sides of the tube. And because the tube is so narrow, 
that cohesion and adhesion is able to allow it to fight against gravity and move all the way up to the tops of the trees. If water didn't have capillary action, then our plants would be much, much, much shorter. So this is what allows for plants to be as tall as they are through this really amazing property that involves both cohesion and adhesion. So in summary, what do we got? Well, first off, remember, cohesion between the water molecules. Again, it's due to that hydrogen bonding that exists. That causes water to have surface tension. It causes water to have a high specific heat. It causes water to have a high heat of vaporization. Each one of those is due to that cohesion between the water molecules. It's not easy to separate water molecule from water molecule because of that hydrogen bonding. So they have that very strong attractive force between each other, which gives them some amazing properties. Next, the repulsion of those like charges is why liquid water is more dense than solid water. Because as those water molecules slow down to the point where they are now solid, that means they are going to arrange themselves in a very specific way. And that crystalline structure has empty space, more empty space than liquid water normally has. And lastly, both adhesion and cohesion is going to what be what allows us to have both the ability for water to dissolve things and capillary action. So water has to be able to interact with something for it to be able to dissolve it. And it has to be able to interact with those thin tubes. Otherwise, it wouldn't be able to go up to the tops of our trees. That's it for this time. Be awesome. Stay awesome.